Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska. There's not too many third generation Alaskans around, is there? There's getting to be more and more, and uh, my husband and I are contributing with that fourth generation. Hopefully both boys are gonna wanna plant roots um, in the state, but yeah, it's, it is something that I'm really quite proud of. Love what? my state and uh, uh, love my family's history there. What brought your grandparents to Alaska? So on my, on my uh, dad's side, the story goes that uh, everybody wanted to come up for the gold. And uh, he made it as far as Ketchikan, which most Alaskans will know is that most southern of the communities. And, and basically realized he didn't have enough money to get up to the gold fields, so he stayed there in Ketchikan and uh, went to work. Actually went to work in a bank where he cashed out the miners when they came with their gold. On my mom's side, she was born up in Nome. Uh, her dad was, uh, was uh, a brand new baby attorney and he got a, a message from one of his, his buddies saying, hey, come up to Alaska. I've come to this town, Ketchikan, and there's only one lawyer. And as long as there's only one lawyer, there's not much work. So I need somebody. So he came up. Um, as a very young man, and uh, as they say, the rest is history. So both my, both my parents uh, grew up in, in Ketchikan, and uh, that's where I was born, and moved around southeast Alaska as a, as a kid growing up, and lived in Anchorage, lived in Fairbanks, so I've, I've got good, good roots throughout the state. What's the difference between Nome and Ketchikan? Well, to begin with, probably a couple thousand miles. Um, uh, in terms of similarities, you are um, both off the grid, so to speak. Ketchikan is, is an island. Nome is on the mainland, but it may as well be an island in terms of, of, of its isolation. They're, um, uh, they're both communities that I think the pioneers looked to uh, as, a, as a place of opportunity, Nome for the gold rush. Uh, Ketchikan, it was about the fisheries, the strength of the fisheries that drew um, not only people from the lower 48, but uh, a strong Filipino uh, contingency. Um, and so both pioneering towns in, in their own right that way. Uh, both beautiful communities to this day, love them. What does your chairmanship of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee bring to Alaska? I think it allows Alaska to be in that national spotlight when it comes to our energy resources. We are a resource-rich state. We only have 720,000 some odd folks, but we have more natural resources, whether they be trees, whether they be fish, our oil, our minerals, uh, our natural gas, our coal, uh, extraordinary mineral base, and so the opportunity to, to uh, contribute to the national conversation on energy is extraordinarily important. And coming from an energy producing state like Alaska, it becomes all the more important. Natural gas is growing in Alaska? Natural gas is growing. You know, we've been, we've been producing natural gas for decades. In fact, um, for 40 plus years, we shipped LNG out of the Cook Inlet area, which is down in the South Central area, to Japan. It was the longest running contract for export um, out of the United States for natural gas, and it was coming right out of, of Cook Inlet there. Um, so we've got good gas reserves down in the South Central area in Cook Inlet but we also have extraordinary untapped reserves up in our North Slope. Uh, we have the potential for methane hydrates, uh, unconventional gas, so it is, it is extraordinary. Our challenge has, has never been, do we have the resource? Our challenge has been, how do you move the resource to market? And, and going back to your question earlier about the role that my chairmanship on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee can play, that, that has been, um, that's been an important part of how we work 
to move out access to Alaska's resources. Um, resources are there, but how do you move them? Senator Murkowski, in your view, has climate change affected Alaska? Absolutely. Absolutely. As one who is, is born and raised there, as one who travels widely around the state, um, particularly to some of our very remote areas, areas that uh, are, are uh, I'd say, predominantly on, on our coast, um, but, but into uh, some Arctic areas where, uh, quite honestly, there hasn't been a lot of, of uh, focus from folks on the outside, elected leaders or otherwise. Uh, I've had an opportunity to come in and see for myself to sit down, to, to hear from elders about what they have observed. These, these are folks, you know, they might not have uh, a PhD, but they've got a PhD in living. And they can tell you what they're seeing. They can, they can tell you what they're seeing with the sea ice and, and the consequence of, of erosion that is coming about because the, the sea ice is receding allowing those waves to build up and it's not just it's not just coastal erosion it's in so many other areas it is it's what they're seeing in in, in browse and habitat things that are growing in places that they hadn't been before in in migratory um, uh, paths of where the caribou are again following some uh, the fisheries so uh, I am one who who looks very honestly at the reality that I see in my state and uh, uh, I believe that our climate is changing and that we're seeing the impacts and how we are able to adapt, how we are able to mitigate is something that as a, as a lawmaker I try to help our state with uh, on a daily basis. Now you've also just recently passed legislation to help with some of the indi indigenous populations mm -hmm. in Alaska, haven't mm -hmm. didn't you? Loan guarantees? Mm -hmm. Loan guarantees, um, you know, when, when I think about the many ways that we can help, uh, that we here in Congress can help those in our, uh, in our native communities um, deal with whether it's the impact of, 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 of climate change uh, through um, uh, helping them develop infrastructure that will kind of push back against the tide, that's pretty tough, it's very expensive, um, offering uh, assistance, technical assistance, loan guarantees, grant programs, um, uh, scientific uh, assistance, research data. There is, there's a host of different ways that we can help, um, but I think it's, it's, it's also important to recognize that these are not just initiatives that would say focus on moving a village, for instance. Uh, community that is is threatened by erosion and they're going to lose their school. They're going to lose uh, the, the 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 airstrip. Um, there are other impacts that we see with with uh, uh, climate change, um, particularly health related impacts. If you have an area that is now drier than it was before, you have levels of dust because you don't have paved roads, um, uh, so you've got respiratory issues that children may be dealing with. Um, so it's, there are a host of different ways that we have to look at this as an issue, and uh, the threats to the people are, are um, I believe, apparent. There are three of you in Congress representing Alaska. 3,714 miles from here is Juneau. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you ever feel like you're fighting against a tide to get sure. people down here to understand? It's always an education. Um, <clears throat> I can talk about Alaska to my colleagues and to members of, of the administration, but even they will admit that they really didn't get it until they flew to Alaska, until they were in that situation where they realized, wait, she was right. There are really no roads down there. These communities, over 80% of our communities in the state of Alaska are not connected by road. So your bus that wants to try to get around Alaska, well, good luck with that. We have our marine highway system that 
you get on the ferry and you can go up and we have we have the parks that goes up and we've got the Richardson that comes down and that's our that's our road system so when you think about um, when you think about rural everybody has rural in their state so when I talk about rural they're like yeah 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 I understand to, to them rural is you, you drive on a, a, a long way and you finally get to a rough and bumpy road and you get to a little town after that and then you go out the back end of that little town and another rough and bumpy road and you're in rural. Well in our in, in Alaska it's beyond rural. It's bush. It's frontier. Um, it is it is beyond what most people can relate to. And so un unless and until you're there to be able to take the Secretary of Energy out to a little uh, a little community outside of Bethel, Alaska where it's Oscarville is not connect connected by road, but in the winter time, the rivers freeze over. And so the way that we access it is we take a truck and we drove down river on the ice. Secretary said it was the first time he'd ever been on a motorcade on a frozen river. So you have to experience it. And I think you can try to relate, but you have to experience it. And so getting getting members of Congress up to see it, getting cabinet members up to see it is important. We're going to have a busy first week in August because everybody wants to come up in the summer. They're not so inclined to, to come up in the winter time. We're going to keep working on that, but uh, it's just as good, maybe even better in the winter. So if you bring members or some of your colleagues up to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, do they see what the pipeline looks like? Do they see what areas what you want to open for for more drilling when you are when you go into the uh, the 1002 area that that piece of the of the of, of the of Anwar at the top of of Alaska in that north slope the 1002 area that has been set aside you will not see pipeline there is no pipeline there is there is nothing in that 1002 area of, of Anwar. There is the community of Koktovik, uh, and that community has its own airstrip, and they've got a school, and they've got a community hall, and they've got a, a little, little restaurant. Not, it's not really a restaurant, it's a little, little uh, lodging. Um, but that's, that's what is in that area existing. There, there is one stub of a of an exploration well that was made back in the early 80s and that's it and that's covered it 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 looks like a, a, a small little skinny box that's sitting there otherwise it is nothing but flat tundra so green and marshy in the summer and and white and and perfectly flat in in the winter time that's the 1002 area now off outside of those boundaries on state lands that's where you will see uh, the development that has come about through Prudhoe Bay exploration and the ongoing discoveries since that and Prudhoe's about let's just say um, 80 miles to the west then of where you would be in uh, in the 1002 area so when I take members up who want to see Anwar will 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 fly up to to Dead Horse slash Prudhoe Bay, which is the original field, so built forty plus years ago. Um, in fact, I actually worked uh, up in in Prudhoe Bay when I was um, just out of out of high school. Excuse me, yes, I was just out of high school. I was in college, and um, uh, worked as they were constructing constructing the pipeline at, at that point in time. So I spent a, a full summer up there. It was an extraordinary experience. But you see, you see that development. That's what people would call, you know, the elephant find. That was, that was what changed the state of Alaska in terms of revenues to the state. And, and then you have what would be described as more satellite fields that spoke out in state areas, uh, again, further to the west of of the Anwar area. Um, 
And what we are seeing now with the, with the level of, of exploration and the finds that they're seeing between the, the satellite areas on the state lands and, and the opportunities within the NPRA, the National Petroleum Reserve, which again is further to the, to the west of, of the 1002. That's where you're seeing um, some, some pretty strong development right now. What do you say to people who are concerned about the environment and think that oil drilling would be, or gas drilling would be a wrong thing to do? I invite them to come up because I think it's important that they see. It takes me back to, to my earlier comments about you need, to, you need to see Alaska to believe it and to understand it. And, and, and what you see when you come into to, to Prudhoe Bay, into the Dead Horse area, is a, a mature, developed oil field that was developed using the technologies from 45 years ago. It's a, it is a much bigger fr footprint. You then go out to, say for instance, the Alpine field or what Conoco is doing out at CD5. You look at the footprint and, and how we have, have reduced the footprint so many times over, people can't even believe that, is this all you're talking about? Is this all you're working off of? This small gravel pad is hosting this level of, of exploration activity. And the reason they're able to do it is because the changes in the technology that have come about in the past four decades plus. So one well that can dive down and spoke out in an area up to eight miles in radius now. That's what our technology is delivering to us. So you don't see it on the surface. The caribou don't see it on the surface. The people who may, may live in the region can't see it on the surface. This is what we're trying to do. We don't want to come in and, 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 and take the land just to take the land. That's, that's, not, that's not part of anybody's plan. We want to be able to access a resource that is below the surface, do so in a way that is, is efficient, is clean, is environmentally sound, allows for the su continued subsistence activity of the native people who live in the region. There's not a lot of communities, there's not a lot of people, but we want to make sure that the native people, the Inupiaq who've lived there for thousands of years are able to continue harvesting their caribou, are able to continue uh, harvesting the whale that come through on an annual basis that sustain them throughout the winter. So there is a balance that goes on in Alaska that I'm proud to talk about because we have, we've, we've made sure that, that the balance is there for, for the people first who live there who need not only the jobs, the resource, but the economy that comes with it. The reality that we have is that in, in the North Slope borough, you have, you have a, a school system that is able to hire some pretty good teachers. You have healthcare that is available for the people who live in this, in this region that is to be admired. You have, you, you can afford your utility costs in Barrow. Barrow is powered by, by natural gas. Nuixit is, is powered by natural gas that comes from the oil fields. You compare that to some of the communities that are still 100% reliant on diesel fuel to stay warm. So, what, what development has brought to the people in the region, it has, it has brought about change. And I know that there is there's resistance, there's always some resistance to change. But when it also brings the benefit of jobs and resources and the ability to live in a cold, dark place, to be able to be warm, to make sure that your kids are educated, to make sure that you've, you've got the opportunity for health care. These are some of the benefits and the advantages that having development in the region bring. 
but the people still demand, and I still demand as their representative, that their ability to access the, the resources on the land for their subsistence, for their food nutrition, but also it's part of their identity. The people of the Inupiaq, they're the people of the whale. The Gwich'in are the people of the caribou. They identify with their food source by name. We can't take that away from them. So we're no longer doing active exploration in the, in the offshore as Shell was doing some years ago. But when Shell was out there, they had, they had stipulations and agreements and um, uh, memorandums of understanding that, that required that when the, when the bowhead whale were migrating through, you're out of the water. The engines aren't running. You cannot, you cannot be out there. When I tell that to people in the lower 48 who come from producing places, whether it's North, uh, North Dakota or California, and tell them that, well, when the whale are coming through, uh, there's no exploration, there's no anything going on. They say, what? You can't possibly do that. And I said, no, that's the condition. That's how you get your social license to operate. You have to work with the, with the people who live there the indigenous peoples who've been there for a thousand years. So it's about balance. It's about balance and it's not easy, but it's very, very important. Senator Lisa Murkowski is chair of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee in the Senate and she is the senior senator from Alaska. Final question, in the next couple weeks, a lot of attention is gonna be paid to you when it comes to the Brett Kavanaugh nomination. Mm -hmm. You've had this before, but what's that, what's that like to have that attention? Well, I like to say that, look, every one of us in the Senate, all 100 of us, have exactly the same vote. I have one vote, as does my, my junior senator from Alaska, as does the most senior member of the United States Senate. But I know that there is a, there is a great deal of attention that has been trained on me uh, because um, primarily of the, the issue of, of Roe versus Wade and what will happen when Kennedy, who was the swing, viewed as that swing member on the, on the Supreme Court when he leaves and, and uh, Judge Kavanaugh were to replace him, what then happens to the balance? And it's not just the balance um, on, on, on women's reproductive issues. It's, there's so many other issues that are certainly a concern for Alaska's constituents. We're a state that believes very, very strongly in ensuring that we're respecting um, Second Amendment rights, for instance. Uh, but trying to, trying to identify or distill out and say that there is one issue that for me will guide my determination on on this nomination or any future nomination for the United States Supreme Court that's not how I operate I have been looking at at Judge Kavanaugh and his record holistically just as I did with every other justice that I've had an opportunity to weigh in on whether it was Justice Kagan or Sotomayor or Gorsuch or Judge Roberts. And so I am perhaps uh, taking more time than some would like me to. Some on the right would say, you need to be deciding right now that you're going to be supporting him. And those on the left would say, you need to decide right now that he is just not acceptable. I don't operate that way. I will take my time. I will be thoughtful. I've joked with my son who's um, finishing up law school that I feel like I'm back in law school because I'm reading the opinions. I want to gauge for myself. And I know it's not, I'm not going to be able to ask him a question on what will you do in X case. I would not ask that question and he would not answer that question. So what I'm trying to, d to do is discern if Judge Kavanaugh has the qualities that I think we're all looking for in a judge. The judicial temperament, the, the, the character, the intelligence, the balance, the, uh, the, the desire to, to, to truly follow the law rather than to, to try to move things in a 
in a more predetermined um, or, per or perhaps political outcome. And so I want to know, how does he view precedent? What does he consider? How, how does he consider settled law to be settled? So I'm looking forward to the conversations. I think it's going to be um, more than several weeks. The, the Judiciary Committee uh, has to go through a, a pretty voluminous um, records request. You have a, a judge who's been on, on the bench now, the, the D.C. Circuit, for 12 years, so there's a lot of opinions out there. You have his history. Uh, in the Bush administration, so you have further records out there. So I'm going to be following all of it, and I am okay being in that space of people accusing me of being too thoughtful on this. I want to be too thoughtful. I think Alaskans expect me to be thoughtful, and I'm I'm, I'm welcoming their opinions, their views. Everybody comes at it with uh, with something that they care about. So there's a process ahead of me. And, uh, and as you've noted, I'm, I'm in the swirl because I, I haven't been pegged into, into either box. And uh, I won't be pegged into a box. I'm going to do my own work on this, and I'm going to do what Alaskans expect me to do, which is be thorough and thoughtful.